You ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Go! Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Acquirers Podcast. My special guest today is Joseph Calandro Jr. He wrote a spectacular book in 2009 called Applied Value Investing, which is about applying value investing principles in a corporate context. And he's written, in addition to that, 50 research publications. He's got a brand new paper that's fascinating and timely because it's about Marvel, which is about to release the biggest movie of all time, April 26, which is when this podcast comes out. Joseph's been looking at how Marvel did it, where it came from, because it was in bankruptcy in 1996. So we're going to talk to him right after this. Go! Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Acquire's Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquire's Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquire's Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquiresfunds.com. Hi, Joseph. How are you? I'm fine. How about yourself, Toby? I'm doing very well, thank you. you you've written a brand new paper uh, it's called M&A Dealmaking, Disney, Marvel, and the Value of Hidden Assets. What is a hidden asset? So, so it, it is what, what the title says. It's something that's on the balance sheet that's frequently ignored. So Seth Klarman wrote about this in his classic Margin of Safety, and he gave three examples. So, so the first was you know, overvalued pension funds. Now you can kind of tell how old that book is just by that because because many pension funds aren't overvalued anymore. But at the time of the writing, um, pension funds were overvalued. Same thing with real estate kind of carried on the balance sheet at uh, prices far less than the than the market value. And the third one is, uh, you know, profitable finance subsidiary. Now, each one of those as as all your viewers know, are kind of well known now they're no longer hidden. Um, balance sheets are, are transitory, but just because, you know, these historical examples really are no longer quote unquote hidden on the balance sheet doesn't mean other things aren't. And more and more what we're seeing on the on the corporate finance side is that um, hidden assets can be involved in, in intangible assets. So it's very hard to get your, own, your arms around an, an intangible asset, as you know, um, but to the extent you can do that, there could be a significant profit opportunity, as there certainly was with 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 uh, Disney when they acquired Marvel. So let's let's just let's go back a little bit further than that. In 1996, Marvel filed for bankruptcy, which people might they find did. shocking now because it's that the, the movies are everywhere and, right. and regular. And there was a battle for control between two very well known uh, corporate raiders, Ron Perelman and Carl Icahn, they didn't actually end up with control of it. They both lost. So t- tell us who won and, and what he paid. Yeah, so that's that's a great question. Um, just by way of, of background, when I was actively teaching, um, I teach by the case method. And by far, the most popular case I ever taught was the Marvel bankruptcy case. Um, again, you have Ron Perlman and Carl Icahn duking it out. It really doesn't get much better than that, but for the topic that neither one of them won, someone else, a man by the name of Ike Perlman, came in and, and actually acquired it. And uh, going through exactly how Marvel got into trouble, um, focusing on the battle of control, but more importantly, who won and why. So at the time, Ike Perlman had a minority interest in Marvel because he was the owner of a firm called Toy Biz. They made the toys for the comic book characters. Um, So why that's important is who his number two was. It's a man by the name of Avi Arad, who, as your viewers may know, the ones who have followed the movies, he was behind the the kind of first generation of Marvel movies, things like X-Men, the first run of Spider-Man and the like. And and he made quite a bit of money for Marvel by doing that. Um, so successful were they that if you fast forward to uh, you know 2009, um, 
Ike Perlman's $238 million investment in Marvel at that time um, grew to $4 billion when Disney decided to acquire them. And we can certainly talk about that. Well, I was, I was just going to say that's uh, it, uh, uh, Bob Iger, I think, was the CEO of Disney at the time. And he took right. a fair bit of heat for uh, that price because there was a suggestion that, that was a, it was way too high for those assets. I think you, right. de- you describe it in your paper as uh, as 57% above what the future value, the net asset value, you describe it as an expected growth requiring a 20% reinvestment rate. So can you just, how was the, how were the, uh, the future value and so on arrived at? And then what, what was the plan for the expected growth? Yeah, yeah, no, a great question. So, so again, a little bit more context before I get right into the, the answer. Um, I published a paper in a strategy journal, corporate strategy journal on the Marvel bankruptcy. And then literally like six months or so later, Disney acquired Marvel. So it's better to be lucky than smart. The editor called me and said, hey, can you can you take a look at this? And uh, I don't like I don't like commenting, especially in a research journal on recent transactions. But this one was really you know, kind of too good to pass up. And and you're right about Bob Iger. And the quote that he um, that I took and I quote in the paper is his statement at the time was we paid a price that reflects the value Marvel created and the value we can create at one company. It's a full price, but a fair price. So as a value-oriented investor, um, an analyst, if you paid a full price, like how are you going to make money? Right? So, so that was really the quote that got me interested in it. And then I looked at it, and I applied the, the value approach on top of it. And sure enough, it came to when you take it through net asset value, earnings power value, franchise value, and growth value – you know, over half of the value is, is locked into growth. And when you look at the reinvestment rate, it's over 20 percent. Like that's a very hard hurdle to overcome. So I very rationally commented that it does not appear that this is a there is no margin of safety in this price. It's going to be very tough for for Marvel to excuse me, for Disney to profit from this acquisition. Um, I was clearly very, very wrong, and understanding why and how I went wrong is the topic of the the current paper, which is my third on Marvel. So, so how did they go wrong? What, or what, or how did how did Disney go right? Rather, how did they uh, exploit that those hidden assets to that they, they've made many times over that uh, that additional um, that that expected growth value that they paid? Yeah, so great question, and. Um, you know, the thing that struck me was when I went back, because like most people, I don't like to be wrong. Um, but unlike most people, I try to really figure out like where I went wrong, why, and to, to learn from it. And, you know, the, the part about this that's, that shocked me was, is that Iger did not lie. He was, his statement, he was absolutely right. He did pay a full price for Disney and a fair price based upon the the general consensus at the time and and that's important right so let's kind of go back in time iron man came out it did very very well um it was immediately followed by the incredible hulk which did not do that well it made some money but not a great deal of money and even though robert downey had a cameo appearance at the end the famous star of iron man and now he's He's one of the three key faces of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, It was at that point where if you're just focusing on the intangible assets of Marvel on a picture-by-picture basis, it will lead you to that $4 billion price, plus or minus depending upon how aggressive you are, but that's where you're going to end up. What that valuation does not consider at all is the value of integrated story arcs and character team-ups, which is what Marvel, under the amazing leadership of Kevin Feige, who, in my opinion, he is to the Marvel Cinematic Universe what the late Stan Lee was to to Marvel. He put together an integrated story arc that was planned out 10-plus years into the future, and then he really focused on executing on each movie 
And he wanted to make each a success not only as a standard, a, a standalone property, but as part of a broader universe that culminates in these key team up movies such as The Avengers, which I think came out in 2012. Um, we just had Thor Ragnarok. That was another one. Captain America Civil War was another one. And now with the Avengers movie Endgame being released at the end of this month. So you describe the this uh, the strategy <clears throat> to exploit these hidden assets, or in particular these sort of intellectual property uh, character type assets as a blue ocean. And you say that there are some risks that the blue ocean may end up being a mere puddle. So how, how does... Uh, how do you navigate those risks? Yeah, so I'm, by way of background, I'm in a, a corporate strategy practice. And uh, I'm not a strategist by training. I came in on the kind of the finance side as well as the industry side, the economic side. Um, the blue ocean concept is a very, very popular strategic theory, you know, which says, you know, don't try to do what everyone else is doing. Look for basically white space, your know, blue oceans, and try to capitalize on those. Now, now the problem with one of the problems with corporate strategy can be when you find something that's that looks like a seeming blue ocean, as you really get into it, it could turn out to be a puddle rather than a blue ocean. So this is the reason why, as you know, given your background, so many corporate M&A deals don't deliver on the value expected because what they, you know, the blue ocean that they saw with synergies or a variety of other things really didn't come to, to materialize. The same thing can happen with anything intangible, such as hidden assets like this. So it's there's a number of steps we identify to go through if you're going to focus on this that'll lead you to believe that, the first of all, the hidden asset is really hidden and that it's really real. It is a real asset, even though people aren't currently paying attention to it. Can you take us through those uh, those steps and how, how, uh, how, uh, how corporate value investors or how corporate teams can apply those to uh, to acquisitions yeah so so great comment and um, with respect to corporate value investing teams you know they are they're certainly there right so firms like you know Lowe's of course um, Berkshire Hathaway obviously Markel Fairfax so there there are a few but they are very very much in the minority um, being a value investor means inherently being taking a contrarian approach. Most people can't do that um, for a variety of reasons. They they kind of follow conventional wisdom and they stay on the beaten path. They won't go outside of it. So it's when I'm talking to an executive, I never lead off with it's the, the value side or I'll bring topics in depending upon the business problem I'm there to advise on. So with respect to M&A, and especially if it pertains to a potential hidden intangible asset is, number one, are the assets really unseen? So if you look at Marvel, um, everyone was focusing on the movie by movie performance of the studio. No one was really focusing on the, uh, integrate, the value of the integrated story arcs, even though they were clearly there. And if you look back in the comic book history, like you saw it, um, the Avengers was a, was a moneymaker for Marvel for quite some time. And that's the second principle, that the, the assets are, are really assets. They have some type of earning power. Um, integrated story arcs clearly had that. They were there at Marvel for quite a long time, but no one was paying attention to them with respect to the studio. So that's kind of the second one. But that only gets you so far, like the core to all of this is a focused value realization strategy. So like, how are you going to do this? How are you going to realize value from it? Or in the case of Marvel, create value from it. Because again, at the steady state, the value that they could earn basically earned the price that they paid. It's a wash. Clearly, their stockholders wouldn't have approved the deal if it was just a wash. So how are they going to earn more than that? And, and I think that is the, the reason why Kevin Feige undertook the approach that he did was to plan these movies out over a decade or more so you could see not just on a movie-by-movie movie basis what was going on, but how they fit into the cohesive framework and kind of what it would mean. Um, and then once they had that, then it came down to the operational expertise. 
So, Joe, just so I can understand, the um, what Marvel had been doing was releasing <coughs> movies on um, on a single movie by movie basis. Find right. a character and then release that movie. And Kevin Feige is that the gentleman's name? It, he is now the the president of of Marvel Studios. His right. insight was that there was these Avengers, which were collaborations where several. Uh, characters were brought together and then they could have a very long story arc that that went went from their collaborations and into their individual movies and back again and he saw that he could use that which that sort of format hadn't been used previously and that would generate that would create more interest in the franchise and generate more money through ticket sales and so on well that's right and it's not just through a, a formal group like the avengers right so so the third movie in the Captain America series was um, a very famous one where Captain America and Iron Man fight. Um, the same thing with Thor. The the third Thor movie involved not just Thor, but Thor and the Hulk. So you're getting you know interaction with two key characters, two or more key characters. And then you have the, the kind of broad group of the formal Avengers kind of doing it. And it was a way to, to kind of monetize these characters. So, for example... If you look at the um, Marvel's chief rival, DC Comics, they also have a movie arm. You know, they have been far less successful in doing this. Um, they've had mixed success handling their properties on a movie by movie basis, but but far less integrating them. So it's not very easy to do. And there are a number of steps that are required to kind of do it, but to the extent people like these characters, why wait two to three years between movies if you could release a solo movie, then a team-based movie, and then the broader version of the movie? People are seeing these characters almost every year, and you know, not just that's not going to generate just movie revenue, but there's kind of the comic book underlay to all that that's going to profit. There's obviously toys, there's apparel, there's also cartoons. So the money-making machine once it starts to roll this way, it can be mighty. And, uh, you know, Disney certainly showed that here. That, um, to, to identify that hidden asset, particularly in relation to the comic books, requires some deep familiarity with the subject matter. Um, and I, I just compare that to that sort of old school uh, value investing approach. I mean, I've done this before. You run a screen for real right. estate that was purchased back in the 70s already so that's been sitting on the books for a very long time and it's carried at book value and presumably there's been right. some appreciation that may not be reflected in the asset value or may not be reflected in the earnings so is that one of the things that you have identified that it really is somebody who has this deep familiarity with the subject matter and uh, to, to have that unique insight that allows them to pay more and then make it work yeah, so so great question. And it's um on the consulting side, we call formally call it information advantage, and that's something that professional value investors also do. Um having that deep familiarity with with the subject matter. And again, because more and more people are becoming sophisticated with financial statements and tools, it's very difficult, especially if you're not one of the really major value investing firms to get a leg up on these people. So, you know, Mario Gabelli's firm, Seth Klarman's, Mitch Julis, Howard Marks, um, Marty Whitman's firm, the late Marty Whitman's firm. I mean, these are all, you know, extremely successful value investors with deep staffs that study and look these th look at these things, you know, 20 hours a day. It's very difficult for, for a corporation to compete with them or anyone else, except in areas where the information advantage is flipped. And if you weren't in media and like a, a party, like one of the reviewers to this paper said, you know, no one but Disney could have done this. And I don't really believe that, right? I mean, you know, looking back, it's very easy, the narrative fallacy to make all sorts of excuses why Disney was, they took a lot of heat doing what they did. It really wasn't a layup for them. They took chances. They were very studious and they were very methodical about how they went about doing it. Um, and I had another reviewer say, well, all the Marvel properties, I mean, it, it, there's really no, no, nothing strategic to this. They're just good characters and every movie associated with them makes money. And that's certainly not true. I mean, the, the Fantastic Four movie that came out a number of years ago did not do well and actually lost money for 20th Century Fox because they did it the wrong way. 
if you don't do it the right way, you're not going to make the type of money that, that certainly Marvel made. And, and again, value investors in general aren't known for acumen in the intangible space, right? So there was a strategy book written by a very prominent professor on the value side where he very famously said that, you know, Apple was going nowhere, right? And this is before the great Apple boom. Clearly wrong. I was clearly wrong when it came to Marvel. I mean, even Warren Buffett, when he bought General Ree, I mean, there were problems there. He paid more than he probably should have. So there are blind spots there. And kind of one man's blind spot is another person's strength. And if to the extent corporate strategists can kind of take this approach and view it from the lens of, of their industry and their firms, they could potentially have an information advantage over the bevy of value investors who are trying to do the same. And then if they do that, kind of create value in a way that could potentially transform their industry the way Marvel certainly has with, uh, with the extended cinematic universe. I think it's interesting that that reviewer said that Disney was the only one who could make it work because I, it, the thought did occur to me that uh, Disney was probably uniquely positioned because they have that familiarity with yeah. characters and how to use characters. Then they have distribution and other advantages. Do you see what they're doing, uh, the, their success with Marvel? Do you think that that led them perhaps to the acquisition of Star Wars with the same sort of view, the same approach? Yeah, so so great. <laughs> That's another good question. So let's look at it this way. Before they bought Marvel for $4 billion, they paid almost $8 billion for Pixar. And again, Pixar with the Toy Story movies, properties, has done very well. Nowhere near as well as, as kind of Marvel has done. Um, they did purchase Star Wars. Um, the Star Wars movies have had some problems associated with them. I won't even watch them anymore. I, I just find them just completely uninteresting. Um, and a number of, of friends of, of mine have felt the same way, both younger as well as older. So it just goes to show you it's it's not really a layup. And, and I think why it hasn't been a layup for them when it comes to Star Wars, why Star Wars movies seem to be so bumpy, um, you know, is the people, is kind of the operational um, people, processes, and technologies that bring these things. So, again, we mentioned Kevin Feige on the Marvel side. It's not just him. He has a team under him, but it's his team. Right. And they are they have proven themselves exceptionally capable of this. And I don't think you're seeing the same type of talent on the Star Wars side. Now, that doesn't mean Disney's going to lose money there because I don't think they are. I just don't think they're not going to be able to maximize it in the same way as as kind of Marvel has. It's not easy to do. Right? And it, it, this is a this is a data point from your paper that uh, Marvel Sorry, Disney, since the acquisition of Marvel, has produced something in the order of 20 movies and they've generated $17 billion in, yeah. um, in, in revenue. And that's excluding the, uh, the, the uh, Avengers Endgame, which comes out uh, today, which I think that the pre-sales are something, they're more than a billion dollars in pre-sales, which is extraordinary. Yeah, I talked to one analyst and he thinks that, now again, we're just talking about movie revenue again we're not talking about comic book revenue toy revenue apparel and and, and animated cartoons on television this is just movies um the analyst i talked to says there are some people that think that this latest movie endgame could make four billion dollars in and of itself which is twice what the last movie made i mean yeah again it does not get much better than this from uh if you're a shareholder in disney you're very happy with kind of what they're doing um Again, it's not to downplay how difficult it was to do this, but for established characters like this in media or for other kind of established intangible assets, it certainly is possible with you paying the right price. Because I think the way Disney looked at it was, look at best, at worst case, if our worst case is a wash, like that's not a bad worst case. Because we have other things kind of going on where we can certainly make our required rate of return. But the optionality of this is so is so convex that if this does work, I mean, it's going to be what, what it is today. Um, and if they're creating a portfolio of these things uh, across their, their vast empire, 
Um, you're going to have certain things that work, certain things that don't work. But if they can kind of institutionalize what Marvel did into some of the more underperforming or lesser performing brands, you know, as we've seen, the appetite for this type of thing with the consuming public is is inexhaustible. Um, their potential for profit is is leak is equally inexhaustible to the extent they can deliver. Disney stock has done reasonably well, but it's been it's been sideways for the the, the last recent while. It's one of the one of those stocks that I hear lots and lots of uh, Buffett style franchise investors get quite excited about. Um, do you have any view on Disney stock itself? Are you allowed to comment on something like that? So I can't comment on from the buy and sell side because I, I am an advisor and I believe they are a client of the firm that I work for. Um, but what I can say is, you know, you know what you would already know. Now people expect this from them, and that expectation is going to kind of flow through the price. So the question for them is going to be, okay, kind of what's next? Um, they they just took over the properties from 20th Century Fox. Um, again, 20th Century Fox has had some wins. They've had some misses too, and they haven't been able to kind of integrate their universe. So there is the potential there. To, to fold those properties, you know, into the, the Marvel kind of universe and, and really extend the current strategy. Um, there's a, a variety of things they can no doubt do on the, the Star Wars side as well. Where Star Wars gets a little iffy is they don't have the decades and decades of source material that the Marvel characters do. They're certainly trying to kind of fill that need. But, but again, it's, it's been kind of lumpy. And then, you know, of course, there's cruises and a variety of other things kind of associated with it. Um, however, they have a habit of reinventing themselves. They are very good at that. You know, this is the firm that that really kind of made its bones with Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs 70 plus years ago. I would not bet against them. Whether it's going to happen next year, five years or 10 years from now, I have no idea. But they have shown themselves, you know, consistently capable of producing, you know, mega-sized initiatives and returns like this, and uh, and look, I'm on the risk side, so I'm a betting man, probably like you are as well. I would certainly not bet against them. Uh, your 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 practice area and your area of interest and research has been uh, the application of value investment principles in a corporate context. What what's the what's the difference when? Uh, managers in a company try to apply these principles versus someone in a firm who um, probably has a, a freer hand with where they can go? Yeah, so the, uh, you know, it's interesting because I'm, I'm asked this a lot when I, when I, when I guess speak at, at, at colleges or universities. Um, and I begin my response by saying, you know, there is a reason why all of the value investors we know of started their own firms. And so Warren Buffett started Berkshire Hathaway, um, Mario Gabelli started Gamco, and you can go down the list. I mean, they, they in some form or fashion, were involved in, in starting a firm because it's, it's very, very difficult um, to take a contrary view in a firm that's not organized that way. So as you know, given your background, um, organizational momentum has a certain logic to it. So there's a way of doing business in firms. There's a way of doing business in industries. Each function that's that's involved in a firm has a certain way of, of doing what it is that they do, going about their work. Um, and at many times, it, it, it involves doing what pretty much everybody else is doing, buying what pretty much everyone else is buying, and paying what everybody else is paying. It's far easier to do that. If you want to go off the beaten path and take a completely contrarian view, um, and you don't have a company wired that way, uh, at best, you're going to get shot down. At worst, you're going to have to find another job, right? I had a chief innovation officer describe it this way. You know, firms are created to suppress innovation. Like <laughs> The innovation was involved in creating them and then delivering on it, and then it ends. He goes, that's just what what happens. And, you know, you've got to find a way to work it into the organization. Um, if you can't do that, again, at best, you're going to just basically go flat in your career. At worst, you're going to have to find another job. So it, it is very, very difficult 
increasingly firms are, I mean, it's much easier for me today than it was seven years ago when I started consulting firms for the simple reason that there's been a variety of, many clients have a variety of problems that have gone through the business as usual process and they, they're still problems. And at that point, it's like, okay, well, let's, let's, let's look at this differently. My hit rate on those types of things are very, very high. And, and successful delivery is exceptionally high and remains so to this day. Um, but if it pertains to an area that's, that's kind of well covered, it's, it's far less so. It's, it's mixed. Sometimes they'll take the input. Other times, kind of, they will not. So it is very, very difficult if you haven't started your own firm or just worked for an exceptionally entrepreneurial or open-minded executive. And again, they're there, but they are clearly the outlier. They're not the, uh, they're not the rule. They can't be because average means average. And in, in, in many social distribution fun- probability functions, um, there are fat tails. When it comes to, to management expertise, it really is a normal distribution. I mean, there are a variety of managers who are average, and there's a very select few like Warren Buffett who outperform, and there's a very select few who grossly underperform like, like the Enron folks did or, or the too-big-to-fail banks that did going into the crisis, fortunately. I imagine that it's very difficult for to be a manager and consider acquisitions when um, this is an observation that I have when I'm uh, industry companies in industries tend to get expensive and cheap at the same time because they're all subject right. to that same business cycle in their industry so when you're flush with cash so are your competitors so when you try to right. buy something in your own industry you're competing with you're trying to buy a company that's going very well and you're competing with other potential bidders who are also doing very well if your thought is I'll go outside the industry to buy something adjacent to what we're doing, then the challenge that you face is you have to persuade everybody on the board that that's a good idea when they say, look, we're doing well in this industry. Why would we look at a struggling industry next door? Well, that's right. Um, I mean, it does happen. I mean, what led me to write the first paper on Marvel was there are and have been a few firms that undertake distressed M&A when their industries are going through distress. Not a lot, but but there are some. With respect to adjacencies, I mean, you look at a a, a value investing base manager like the late Henry Singleton of Teledyne. Um, you know, Warren Buffett said that he had like the best capital allocation record. Uh, I think that record still stands today, although Kevin Feige and Bob Iger are kind of challenging it with with what's going on at Marvel. But um, I mean, he had a traditional conglomerate. Uh, but the parts the parts worked, and he made it work. And I've spoken to people who have worked for him. You know, he was just an, an exceptionally talented man um, and skilled man, not just in his core technological competency, but finance, strategy, and, and a variety of other things. If you have the right executive and the right team with the right vision, it can be made to work. The problems, I think, start when, you know, it's necessary if you're running a business, as you know, to manage function by function. I mean, the accounting books have to come out. Current products have to be sold. They have to be serviced. There's no way of getting around that. Some firms right now are trying to get around it by creating special, like, innovation functions. My firm advises on that. I'm not a big proponent of a separate innovation function. If you're going to be innovative, be innovative. Just recognize it for what it is. I mean, there's a time and place for business as usual. There's a time and place where you're going to try to do something new. And there's kind of ways and processes to approach each. And there's no reason why that can't be done within the um, constraints and confines of of one enterprise. Are you ever part of the discussion uh, at a board level whether uh, a company should buy back stock or pay a special dividend or or any of those sort of... um considerations rather than, you know, as opposed to doing an acquisition? So I've been, I've advised executives on it, not that topic at the board level for a variety of reasons. Um, And when I, again, when we talk to finance executives, it puts them in a tough spot, right? So, you know, if CEO and a board wants to do a buyback and the stock is fairly priced on the marketplace, but your boss and his boss, meaning the board, want to do it, it's kind of hard to go in there and argue we're, we're fairly priced. Very few of them do. 
I mean, it, it, at that point, the decision's been made. It, it just becomes a matter of you know, putting the transaction through. And again, that's part of the organizational dynamics I talked about. Whether that's right or wrong is a subjective question. As a value guy, I wouldn't want to do it. But again, as an employee, I understand why they want to do it. We have nothing else to do with the cash. You have to put it to work. I mean, there's a whole host of ways of rationalizing it. Again, it's very difficult to take a position like Mr. Buffett and other value investing CEOs have to say, look, I want a lot of cash on my balance sheet. I really don't care what kind of current returns are. Given where we are in the cycle, what's going on, I need cash because when this corrects, opportunities are going to come up, my phone's going to ring, and I want to not just answer it, I want to answer it with, okay, I hear what's going on, I offer you X. Ready cash, payable right now. When companies are in distress, it's very hard to say no to that. But it's also very hard to kind of explain that to a board um, and to other types of organizational committees and structures when they're not philosophically wired to kind of think that way and when they're focused really on the here and now for whatever reason rather than the next like five or ten years. Joe, you're a, a managing director at a very large global consulting firm. You're a fellow at the Gabelli Center for Global Security uh, Analysis. And you've written all of these research publications. How did you get started? Uh, how did you find this as your area of interest? And what, what, what did you study at, at, at uni? And how did, you, how did you get to this point? So in, in a very long, circuitous way. So so came out of college, started work in the insurance industry um, and liked it. That's why I stayed in it. And then in 1992, Hurricane Andrew struck. And, and then that was a seismic event. And, and I knew that things were going to change. So I dug out the old calculus books and I boned up on my derivatives pricing. And uh, I was kind of fascinated by it. So I started trading. Right? Statistically, it wasn't through the fundamentals. And uh, for my first four years, I did exceptionally well. So ridiculously high, sharp ratios. I mean, thought I kind of had it all nailed, right? And then we go into 1997. I'm up almost 50%, heavily net short the dollar, and then currency markets close at 3 p.m., and at 3.02, the global central banks come in and defend the dollar. My stops were clearly run. I couldn't get out, and I went from being up massively to being down. I think I stayed up for two days kind of fighting the position, and I liquidated it. And um, I told the clients that I was working with, like I sent them back their money, um, and a couple called me back and said, you know, why are you doing this? And I said, well, look, I don't, no one likes losing money, but I don't understand like how I lost money or why. So for the next three or four years, I, I kind of investigated like how or why. And if you read the book Fooled by Randomness by Nassim Taleb, I made like all the mistakes he outlined in that book. Absolutely every one. I, and I learned the lessons the hard way. And, um, and I was working for General Re at the time. And then Warren Buffett bought it. And he paid $22 billion for that firm, even though they had a book value of $8 billion. I knew by working there that it was not a franchise. Probably was in trouble, right? But I couldn't get over like why he, like, like what he saw that, that I clearly didn't see. And then a quarter after he bought it, Genry's results tanked. And it's, it was trouble for him for quite a long time. Right, he's the most successful investor in history, and he made a huge mistake. Like, 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 how did this happen? Um, so I took the value course at Columbia. I really kind of got into it, and uh, you know, the immediate logic of it really kind of hit me. Um, you know, rather than assume all these things away in a model like I did when I was trading, like you really deal with them up front through a process, right? You kind of make an initial assessment, and then you dig into things to find out. Okay, was that does that initial assessment need to be adjusted upwards or downward, and why? And the value investors who do this professionally are very, very good at that. Really, kind of understanding line by line where the value is, where it's not, if they can profit, how, and then have a process in place to to kind of surface that value over time. Exceptionally good at it. But when I finally figured out that that's what they were doing and how they were doing. You know, I'm in my late 30s, <laughs> which is I did not want to go back and try to manage money again. Um, uh, I, have, I have a family to support like most people. And, and I like the business world. I mean, I like I like corporate America. So 
how to kind of bring this in. And I've really focused on the the kind of risk side and the M and A side. And I can certainly give you examples on how to how I've integrated this into both my practice as a consultant and a uh, and on the uh, corporate side, if if you'd like. Well, sure. Let, let's uh, let's. Why don't we start with what 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 was Buffett's mistake with General Rhea? My recollection is that they had these enormous derivatives positions that uh, they pro- that possibly Buffett and Munger hadn't fully appreciated how extensive they were. So so there there was derivatives and and they were there. Um, they really weren't problematic. That wasn't really where where Genry went off the rails. Um, you know, where they went off the rails was their kind of core business, the business of insurance and reinsurance underwriting. Um, so you got to understand like where we were in 98 and 99 from an industry perspective. Um, the market, the insurance, reinsurance market at that time was what we call very, very soft, meaning prices were very depressed and terms and conditions were very, very broad. Um, it was a particularly vicious soft market cycle, not unlike what we think may happen on the insurance and reinsurance side over the next five or 10 years. Um, so, you know, Genry, like like pretty much every other player or most of the other, other players in the space, um, really let their underwriting control slip. Um, they let their reserves slip. And, you know, it's long tail business, meaning that you sell a policy today and the claims don't really start for five, six, seven years in the future, however long, but it's not instantaneous. So you, you know, the problem with insurance is you really don't know what your cost of goods sold are at the time of sale. You kind of make these estimates. If your estimates are aggressive, you could be exceptionally wrong. And that's effectively kind of what happened there. Um, from a, for a variety of reasons, they made the wrong decisions. The firm wasn't led really as well as it should have been. The firm was not led anywhere near as well as it had been led many decades before in its history, which is really what attracted Buffett to the the firm in the first place. And then, you know, once the the insurance results tanked and a variety, we had the tragic September 11th terrorist attacks. So there were concentration issues. A variety there was regulatory issues there too. There were a variety of things related to the core insurance business that uh, you know Mr. Buffett corrected after he had bought the firm. And that's really what led him to to suffer the losses that he did there. And and what what other uh, exam what other case studies do you have of the the application of these principles that you that the, the ones that you like to discuss? Well the flip side of the Gen Re case is the Geico case, right? Which is, you know, Geico is to personal lines insurance what you know, Marvel and Disney are to media. I mean, it has just been such a, an absolutely resounding success. Um, and, you know, given what they did, right, take automobile insurance, which most people would prefer certainly not to talk about. And, you know, through a very, very innovative um, and entertaining media campaign, really turned it into a strength. And, and again, this is this is a, a, a really good example of my earlier comment. You know, you don't make innovation a kind of a separate thing in and of itself. You try to find a way to do that in your core business and then just execute strongly on it. And, you know, Geico under Tony Nicely is is really the, the preeminent case study of that in, in financial services. So that's that's another one. And uh, Lou Simpson, who, was a, uh, who, who ran their equities or ran their investment side, was also part right. of that that success i was i was discussing on twitter yesterday uh, fanny may uh was one of those stocks that uh, lots and lots of very well respected value investors had positions in fanny may from very early on and to their credit i think most of them or the ones at least the ones that i know of in uh, you know so simpson munger buffett and uh peter lynch and a few other guys had these um, positions on when they were going very well and to their credit as soon as their underwriting st- or, or their mortgage underwriting standards or the mortgage writing standards dropped when they sort of started aggressively acquiring new business that was the point at which uh, most of those guys sold out right. even though the stock then continued to appreciate for a number of years before right. the real problems became apparent when it did and now it's in conservatorship which is uh, sort of the, the government version of, of bankruptcy do you, do, do you know do you know the Fannie Mae story at all? Are you are you familiar? Yeah, with I've, I've read the books on it, um, and I remember them. They weren't a client of mine, but they were a friend. They were a client of a friend of mine, 
And, uh, you know, kind of when I poked into it, um, I mean, again, this whole field of structured finance, right, where where you're just kind of creating financial products due to you know, some regulation, tax, or other type of workaround. I mean, there's there's generally no value associated with that. You're just kind of shifting things across a balance sheet. And there's currently ways to play it to make money or not. But like those types of things, I found I never found very interesting. I don't I don't like them. Um, clients of mine that have them on their balance sheet, you know, I just I warn them to hedge, watch them closely because when these things go, they go strong. Um, and, and you know, unfortunately, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and a bunch of the other things kind of got certainly got caught up in that. Um, I know that you have a new book coming out in the next few years. Are you allowed to discuss that at all? Are we not 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 necessarily the content of the book? I know that the book is uh, is there's a very long review process for books of this nature. <laughs> the the book is the book is excellent. It's one of it's uh, I uh, I'm a little jealous uh, or envious rather. I wish I'd written it myself. It's Thank a fantastic you book. Can you can you I give us a little taste of what? Uh, what the book's about and what, when you expect it to emerge. Yeah, sure. No, thank you for asking. I appreciate it. I, um, you know, my first book uh, is called Applied Value Investing, shows how to apply value investing principles to you know, corporate M&A and risk management, basically. Um, what I try to do in my next book is to extend it um, from M&A and risk management into, you know, corporate strategy and corporate management. So, so we talk about things, um, and we have a few case studies in there um, surrounding that. And, and Columbia is going to be published by Columbia University Press. It's currently in its second round of reviews, all of which have been very, very good. Uh, and the manuscript that you were kind enough to review for me has uh, has been submitted. So, yeah, the next year I'm going to be in, uh, you know, editing hell, as they say, <laughs> getting this thing ready. Do, do you, what's, what's the working title? What, what are you calling it right well, now? The working title right now is uh, Value Investing in Corporate Management. And when, uh, when do you expect it to, to come out? Expected publication is spring 2020. Spring 2020. So that's about a year away. It's about a year away. Well, that's very exciting. Thank um, you. And we'll, I'll have to have you back on then when that comes out so we can... We can I'm going go to hold you to that. Well, I, I, I'd be happy to. I'd, we can go through it in some detail when that comes out. Great. Great. Look forward to it. Well, thanks very much, uh, Joe, for spending some time with me today. If if folks want to get in contact with you, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, so my um, my my email is uh, J T A Calandro C A L A N D R O at yahoo dot com. If you Google me, you'll you'll find my social science research network authors page, and you could also get in contact with me through that or my Gabelli Fellows page at Fordham. You can get in contact with me through that as well. And your 2009 book is Applied Value Investing. If you haven't read it, you should because it's excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Calandro, Jr., thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Toby.